Welcome back. We're going to continue to discuss kingdom animalia. We're going to focus, though, in this lecture on the vertebrates. Now, in the last lecture, we talked about basic characteristics that all animals have. Remember that animals are eukaryotic, meaning their cells have a nucleus. They're multicellular. They're heterotrophs. They're motile, and they display a diploid life cycle. Now, last lecture we focused on the invertebrates. These were the organisms that did not have a backbone or, or an endoskeleton made of bone or cartilage. We're going to discuss today in this lecture the last phylum called chordata. These are the chordates and they include the vertebrates, the organisms that do have an endoskeleton made of bone or cartilage. Chordates are considered deuterostomes because in those early, in, during that early development, the blastopore, that first hole, becomes the anus. Okay, the anus develops first. Also, most chordates have an endoskeleton on the inside which allows for muscle attachment. This allows them to have greater abilities to move. But not all chordates have that endoskeleton. There are, however, four characteristics that all chordates do share, and we're going to discuss them here. The first one is the notochord. It's a dorsal support rod found in the organism. Now, dorsal means that it runs along its back. Now, in vertebrates, this notochord becomes the uh, vertebral column. It becomes the backbone. Second, they all have what we call a dorsal hollow nerve cord. Now, this still runs along the back of the organism, and when it is protected by the vertebral column, we call it the spinal cord. Third, all chordates have what we call pharyngeal pouches during embryonic development. These pouches allow for gas exchange in early development. Last, all have a post-anal tail. This means it extends past the anus. Now, some chordates display all four of these characteristics their entire life. However, in others, these structures can be modified and changed as they develop. As humans, we no longer have pharyngeal pouches or a postanal tail. These structures have been modified. The pouches become our auditory tubes, the tubes in our ears. They also become our tonsils, thymus glands, and parathyroid glands. The postanal tail for us becomes our tailbone. So now let's look at each group found in the phylum chordata in a little more detail. Before we can completely discuss the vertebrates, we need to discuss a few invertebrates that are in this group. These animals still have the four characteristics seen on the previous slide at one point in their development. That's why they're placed in the group chordata. But their notochord is never replaced with bone or cartilage. So the first group are what we call the lancelets. They belong to the subphylum called cephalochordata. These live in marine environments and are only a few centimeters long. Lancelets will bury themselves in the sand um, in shallow waters and they're filter feeders. They also retain all four chordate characteristics throughout their life. Tunicates, on the other hand, are the next group and they are in the subphylum Eurochordata. They also live in the ocean and they are also known as sea squirts. The tunicates larvae display all four characteristics of chordates, but they undergo metamorphosis and as adults, they only retain the gill slits. They become then sessile filter feeders at this point. Now let's actually discuss the vertebrate groups. From this point on, all the animals have some sort of endoskeleton, whether it's composed of bone or cartilage. The earliest vertebrates were the fishes, and they are divided into several groups. The first group we want to look at is class agnatha. Class agnatha are the jawless fish. They have a cylindrical body, and they have no scales, no jaws, and no paired fins. There are only two groups of jawless fish. They are the hagfish, which you see here in the picture, and then there are also the lampreys. Now the last two pictures are a picture of a lamprey. Hagfish are scavengers, and they're, that means they're going to eat off of dead organisms. However, lampreys can be parasitic. What they do is they suck onto a fish, burrowing in their teeth, and they'll tap into the fish's circulatory system and they'll take nutrients that way. The next class of fish we want to talk about are the class chondrichthys, the cartilaginous fish. This class includes sharks, rays, and skates. These fish have powerful jaws, and most individuals in this group are predators. 
Now, sharks especially have well-developed senses, and these senses aid them in being very good predators. One that they have is the ability to sense electrical currents in the water. They also have a lateral line system down the sides of their body where they can detect pressure waves when something swims by. Last, they also have a very good sense of smell. The last group of fish we want to talk about are the osteichthys. These are the bony fish. The bony fish are the most numerous and diverse group of vertebrates. Their bodies are covered in scales and they have a single loop circulatory system. I'll show you a picture of the circulatory system a little bit later. There are two groups within this class. The ray finned fish use their fins for balance and also to propel their bodies forward. The fins are thin. And examples include perch, trout, red snapper, salmon, and the list could go on and on with this group. They all breathe through gills. Ray finned fish have diverse ways of life. Some of them are filter feeders, like herring. Others are carnivorous predators, like piranhas. And then still others are what we would call opportunistic, which means they just feed on whatever is available, and that's what you see with trout. The second group of bony fish are the lobed finned fish. The low finned fish have fleshy fins, which can support weight, and this allows for movement on land. They also have very immature lungs for breathing air on land. These guys could have been the ancestor for tetrapods. Tetrapods mean they're four-legged animals that live on land. And some examples of these are the lungfish that you see here and the coelacanth. So these are your examples of the low finned fish. The next class evolved the ability to live on land. This is the class amphibia. And it actually means living both on land and in water. The members of this class include frogs, toads, salamanders, and newts. Amphibians have jointed limbs, eyelids, ears, and a voice producing larynx, which are all new characteristics that are not seen in fish. Most of the members in this group lead what we call a double life. During the larval stage, the tadpoles live in water and they breathe using gills. As the individuals develop, jointed appendages and lungs for breathing air begin to develop and they move on to land. Amphibians also have what we call a three-chambered heart. Again, I'll show you a picture of this a little bit later. And amphibians cannot completely move on to land altogether. They also require water for reproduction. The eggs that are laid, that you can see in there in this picture, are not protected from drying out, so they need to be near water. Plus, when they hatch, the larval stage has to have water access since they breathe through gills. But this is the first group that can live part of its life completely on land. The next class is what we would call reptilia. Now, reptilia are the reptiles. Reptiles are the first, first group that evolved the ability to reproduce away from water, and they did this with the development of the amniotic egg. The amniotic eggs eliminate the need for a swimming larval stage like you see in amphibians. This is because they have a shell that protects the developing embryo from drying out, and the development of what we would call extra embryonic membranes, such as the coron, the yolk, and the allotosis, which provide nourishment to the new embryo or offspring, and they also remove waste from the offspring. Examples of reptiles include alligators, crocodiles, turtles, snakes, and lizards. Reptiles are covered in a hard, keratinized scale, which prevents the loss of water. It also offers protection from predators. Reptiles also have well-developed lungs. And most of them have what we would call a three-chambered heart, but some actually have advanced to a four-chambered heart. This is what we would see in, like, crocodiles. And here's what we're talking about with the chambers of hearts. You'll notice in the fish there's only two chambers. In the amphibian there's three, but in the reptile you see that we start to have almost completely four. You still see a little bit of mixing of red and blue blood. That's oxygen versus deoxygenated blood, and you do still see some purple in here. Reptiles, just like fish and amphibians, are what we would consider ectotherms. This means that their body temperature matches the temperature of their external environment. Okay, so ectotherm is a new term that you should know. Also located in this group are the birds. Birds are in the group reptilia. However, they are part of the class that we call aves. 
Birds have feathers, which are believed to be modified reptilian scales. They also have an amniotic egg, but the shell is hard in their eggs versus that leathery shell that we see in reptiles. Birds are adapted for flight, and they have several anatomical structures that aid them in this flight. Well, one, they have wings. Two, they have hollow bones. These bones are lighter so that it helps them fly. They have beaks with no teeth. Teeth are actually pretty heavy, and so they don't have teeth. Teeth would weigh them down. They have very efficient lungs. These lungs allow them to get oxygen to their muscles very quickly so that they can be successful. They also have a large breast muscles that are attached to a very large sternum, which helps them flap their wings. And again, they have no bladder. Remember, bladders store urine. They don't need to store urine because that would weigh them down, okay? So they get rid of that and they don't have a bladder. Birds have a four-chambered heart, okay? So they have a four-chambered heart and they are what we would consider endothermic. Endothermic means that they can generate their own body heat. This means that their body temperature is going to be different than the temperature on the outside. Traditionally, birds were classified based on their types of beaks. So if their beak was curved like a bird of prey, they could actually rip through um, flesh. It could be that their beaks were really long, like a hummingbird, so that they could access nectar from flowers. So they were normally named by beaks. Then they would look at their feet to name them by their feet or classify them by their feet. And then finally, their habitat where they live. The last class of the phylum chordata is the class mammalia. There are two main characteristics of mammals. First, they have hair, and they have milk-producing mammary glands. Like birds, mammals are what we call endothermic, and they have a four-chambered heart, which you can see here. See how it has four complete chambers, okay, and there's two complete circuits. No mixing of oxygen versus deoxygenated blood. This makes our circulatory system very efficient. Now, the characteristic of hair helps insulate and prevent heat loss and mammals are more active even in cold weather. The milk producing glands allows the mammals to feed their young without leaving them to find food. And it creates a bond between the mother and offspring that ensures parental care. Now there are three types of mammals present today. The monotremes are the first group and these are the mammals that lay hard shelled amniotic eggs like birds. Once their offspring hatch out of the eggs though, the mother does feed them using their mammary glands, feeds the milk. The only two animals in this group are the duck-billed platypus and the spiny anteater. Marsupials are the next group of mammals. The offspring begin their development inside the female's body, but they are born in a very immature state. The immature newborn has to then crawl, you know, they're normally blind, they have to crawl into a pouch in the, in the mother's abdomen. Inside this pouch is where the offspring will continue to develop because this is where the mammary glands are located. So they receive the milk and continue to develop. Almost all marsupials live in Australia. Now there are a few exceptions that can be found in Central and South America, but the possum is the only marsupial that occur occurs north of Mexico. Other examples of marsupials include the kangaroo, the koala, and the now thought to be extinct Tasmanian wolf. The majority of mammals belong to the placental mammal group. During development, these mammals rely on the placenta. This is an organ for exchange between the mother's blood and the fetus. So the mother's blood delivers nutrients to the fetus, and then the fetus um, sends its waste back to the mother, and the mother gets rid of it. There are many groups of placental mammals, and there's a bunch listed in your book. We have first like the undulates. The undulates are like your hoofed typed animals. We also then have the carnivores. Carnivores are those that are going to eat meat. So like here you would see a bear. We also have the primates. Primates include the gorillas, the monkeys, us as humans. We also have the cetaceans. This is like your whales and your um, dolphins and things like that. These are still mammals even though they live in water because they actually do breathe with lungs. They also produce milk for their offspring. Chipotera is the next one and these are your bats. We also have the rodents like mice. Next are the proboscidans. These are like your elephants. The lagomorphins, rabbits, and then of course insectivores. Now these are the guys that are going to focus on eating insects like you see here with moles. These are normally the animals that you think of when you hear kingdom animalia. But remember that these animals range all the way from sponges, which are the simplest animals, up to mammals, which are the most complex. 
I hope you've enjoyed these lectures over animals and I hope it has, has cleared up some issues. Now you're going to have one more lecture in this unit from me. The body systems, which will be later covered in this unit, you guys are going to cover using PowerPoints um, on discussion board number three. So if you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to ask.